In August 2017, Professor Laura Weinrib of the University of Chicago's Law School wrote a piece for the Los Angeles Times. She wrote, Commentators have rightly observed that the ACLU has defended far-right speech since its founding despite fierce criticism. But there's a common and mistaken premise in this analysis. It assumes that the organization, the ACLU, has always believed, as it does today, that, quote, freedom of expression is an end in itself, unquote. In reality, the early ACLU viewed free speech as a tool of social justice suited to particular purposes under particular conditions. Weinrib is a professor of law and associate member of the University of Chicago's Department of History. As a legal historian, her scholarship explores the intersection of constitutional law and labor law. She's the author of the widely discussed book, The Taming of Free Speech, America's Civil Liberties Compromise, which traces the emergence during the first half of the 20th century of a constitutional and court-centered concept of civil liberties as a defining feature of American democracy. Weinrib graduated from Harvard Law School, then completed a PhD in history at Princeton. She had received an A.B. in literature and a Master's of Art in comparative literature from Harvard University. She clerked for Judge Thomas L. Ambro in the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. I talked to her about the ACLU's early history and how best understand today's commitments to free speech expressed by various organizations and political players. Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. No, this is not cabaret, it's Think About It, a podcast about the power of ideas and how language can change the world, with Uli Baer. I'm really excited. I'm going to speak today. I have here on Skype Connection, Laura Weinrib, who is a professor at the University of Chicago Law School. So first of all, Laura, thank you for joining Think About It today. It's a pleasure. You are uh, both a historian and a legal scholar, and you have a PhD in history and a JD, and you've done all this work. You also have an undergraduate degree in literature, I think, right? That's right. <laughs> which I, I can relate to. Um, and you've written a book which has gotten a lot of attention uh, called The Taming of Free Speech, America's Civil Liberties Compromise. And I wanted to start us out just asking how you got interested. You are a labor a uh, historian, you're a legal scholar in different areas, and how did you get interested in this history of how our country comes up with what we today think and mean by the First Amendment and by free speech? Yeah, you know, I actually didn't start as a labor historian. I sort of uh, fell into that as I was researching the book. So uh, this was one of those stories where I went into the archives expecting to find something very different from what I found. Um, I was researching the history of what we think of today, I think, as conflicts between civil rights and civil liberties. So I wanted to understand how the early civil liberties movement formulated its policies on hate speech, controversies like birth of a nation and its censorship, the rights of the KKK to march in Boston. And what I found actually was that while the early ACLU had been active in those types of battles and had taken the positions that we would have expected it to take, it actually really was not the driving factor for the ACLU's policy in the 1920s and 30s. It wasn't an issue that was driving their agenda to the extent that they were thinking about issues like the rights of minorities uh, and the costs of speech that infringed on their rights. They really saw race, among other issues, as a function of the class struggle. So the language again and again was, and you know, it's language that we can recognize, of course, as misguided in retrospect, but it was deeply held not only by the ACLU, but by many of its allies, even within the NAACP. The sense was that the race issue was a function of the class struggle, and that if the class struggle were resolved, racism would simply go away. I want to stay for one moment here, what you just said, how you started, the difference between civil rights and civil liberties. If you can tease that apart 
Yeah, so in now, of course, as a historian, I want to be cognizant of the fact that these terms were very much in flux during this period, and it actually wasn't until at least the 1940s that these terms that I'm using today to signify different categories would have been understood as uh, differentiating between buckets of rights. Today, we tend to think of civil liberties to oversimplify as rights asserted against the state. We might think of them as autonomy or freedom from state interference. Civil rights at one level tend to be rights that are connected to equality. Now, the term civil rights, I should just say, has had a lot of different meanings uh, over the course of American history. And in the 19th century, it would have been used uh, to describe a particular category of rights, including the rights to sue and testify. It would have been distinguished between uh, from social rights and from political rights. But today we think of civil rights as rights related to equality, often racial equality, and they're rights that very often require state interference or state intervention in order to exercise them. So in that, they're quite distinct from civil liberties. So civil rights are what we think of. The state has to make sure that groups have rights, that have equal standing opportunities, et cetera. And civil liberties are where we think my right, what you said, my autonomy, my freedom has to be protected against the state's overreach and restricting me. Let's say this is very rough, but it's sort of for non-lawyers, this would be the way to think about it. That's right. So, and so the period you looked at is the um, right around World War One, sort of 19 teens and then the 20s, right? And this is the this is the birth of the what today the ACLU is. So the ACLU is founded in 1920. And this also happens to be the moment when the court looks at the First Amendment for the first couple of cases that become very important. So it's really 100 years ago, the moment you're looking at here. That's right. So I'm looking at roughly 1910 to 1940 or 1945, but the ACLU, as you said, was founded in 1920, and a core part of the project is to understand both the prehistory of the ACLU, but the ACLU and I should say not just the ACLU, right? So the ACLU, it turns out, plays a really core role in formulating our modern understanding of civil liberties. I think this is a point we've understood, but maybe not fully, because there's a sense that the modern understanding of civil liberties was driven by visionary Supreme Court justices like Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. and Louis Brandeis. And in fact, I want to pivot our attention a bit to the advocates who were bringing these cases, who often had quite different understandings of civil liberties, of free speech, of the judicial role. But in any case, it turns out that the ACLU was really central to this effort over the 20s and 30s, but not alone. So the ACLU was working together with other organizations and with other government agencies. I described the ACLU as brokering a compromise between labor radicals and conservatives that actually, to a pretty significant extent, excluded the progressives and new dealers that we have long thought of as being the principal architects of the modern civil liberties concept. So the, you know, methodologically, it's, I sort of used a hub and spoke model where I got into this through the ACLU, but I was looking at the other actors that were corresponding with the ACLU, that were litigating against the ACLU, and that brought me down some very unexpected paths. So it turns out that groups like the American Bar Association and the National Association of Manufacturers and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, as well as labor groups like the IWW and the AFL, all played crucial roles in advancing, eventually settling on the concept of civil liberties that we have today. And when you said they broke or a compromise in the labor disputes, it seems to be there's two, there are many sets of cases, but there are cases of anti-war protest. So people are protesting the draft, and then there are people who are trying to defend the rights of workers to strike or use any other form of expression for their own advance their rights. So there seem to be two sets of big cases that come down and that it's unthinkable that we would prohibit somebody from protesting against a war, for example. But this seems to usher in this new era of the First Amendment as a tool to think about what what rights citizens have. And then in the in the union and the labor issue, that's a separate aspect. 
Yeah, that's right. So I said I sort of unexpectedly fell into the labor history here, and that's because it turned out that the early memoranda, the early cases with which the ACLU and its organizational precursors were involved were not primarily the cases we think of as foundational today. What was really upsetting them and mobilizing them were the cases that we associate with labor rights. And so this is an important a premise that we should unpack a little, which is that I've, I've used the term modern civil liberties movement or modern understanding of free speech a few times. So let me clarify what I mean by that. I think we, there's a shared understanding today that free speech under the First Amendment means the right to articulate unpopular political ideas, as well as other views that may be considered disagreeable, and that the government is very limited in its ability to regulate speech, and to the extent that it tries to do so, the judiciary is the institution that's charged with policing the boundaries, with ensuring that the government doesn't unduly trample on free speech. You made two points. First, we think that we should be careful that the state doesn't suppress the citizen's right to speak. And secondly, that we turn to the courts. So there's a huge symbolic and actual role played by the courts, all the way up to the Supreme Court, but all the courts, that we would think we would turn to a court and say, my rights have been infringed. So you're saying this is the our contemporary understanding, right? That's why a lot of things go right away to what would the court say about this issue? That's right. That's right. And notice also that it's a conception of free speech that is state skeptical. The offending actor here is state censorship. And it's one that uh, privileges, in some sense, it turns on a counter-majoritarian understanding of the judicial role. Uh, and all of those elements of the modern understanding were very much up for grabs in the period I'm studying. So maybe we should back up a little bit and explain why that's the case. So I think we know by now that there was nothing like the modern understanding of the First Amendment for the first century of American history and, and essentially until World War One. So there's a convention. We actually have to underline this point. It's come up in many, many of my conversations with all of your colleagues. But um, yeah. as you know, I, you're a law professor, but I have people tell me all the time, well, since 1791, there's been free speech in this country, and especially, and then they quote one of today's rulings, especially this has always been protected. So you just sure. said from 1791 until <laughs> 1919, the First Amendment isn't even referenced. So over 100 and some 20 some years. No mention. In ter that's absolutely right as a matter of Supreme Court decisions interpreting the constitutionality of legislation. Now, the First Amendment was invoked at a rhetorical level quite often during the 19th century, but in, in terms of the willingness of the judiciary to look at an act of Congress and say that infringes on a constitutional right. That exceeds what were then called constitutional limitations. That simply wasn't part of the landscape in the 19th century or early 20th century. So how does it shift? How does the center of gravity shift to the courts and the judiciary? Why don't we just leave it to the legislative to say there are laws and some laws may not be constitutional and they should work it out? Why does it shift that the there's more power accorded to the judges and the courts to decide what's really constitutional in the interest of protecting the individual against state censorship. Well, that's right. So this is the core question, I think, that we haven't paid sufficient attention to. So just to sort of put on the table the conventional understanding of how this happened. Uh, so everybody understands that the courts weren't enforcing, or at least the federal courts weren't enforcing a robust right to free speech until at least World War I. And the conventional story is that during World War I, the censorship of ideas was so egregious that a set of judges awoke to the costs of this kind of repression and began to enforce a more rigorous understanding of constitutional limitations, of limits first on prosecutorial discretion and eventually also on the ability of legislatures to curtail speech. And the conventional idea is that, as I said, this was a Holmes and Brandeis uh, invention together with some prominent free speech theorists like Zechariah Chafee and others who began to articulate our modern understanding of free speech. The, the trouble with this 
view, first of all, is that it took at least another decade for the famous Holmes and Brandeis dissents to start getting traction as majority opinions. There's just a fundamental timing problem here, which is that despite the brilliance of these decisions, which we have lionized in retrospect, they did not manage to persuade judicial majorities for quite some time. The problem goes further than that, which is that actually many progressives in this period disagreed with these decisions. Now, this isn't to say that they weren't sympathetic to free speech. And so this is where I really want to distinguish between the judicially enforced First Amendment and free speech. Progressives, for the most part, although many had tolerated wartime repression in the early part of the war on the theory that the war to end all wars superseded the right to free speech and that you had to suspend those rights during the duration of the war and that, as many of them said, once the war ended, there would be time enough to assert one's right to free speech. So this was a common view. Nonetheless, those progressives who believed free speech had been unduly suppressed during the war and that it was important to return to a more robust understanding of free speech still doubted whether the judiciary was the right institution to accomplish that goal. And in fact, throughout the 1920s, as groups like the ACLU began increasingly to pursue these cases in the courts, esteemed progressive outlets like the New Republic would take them to task for this and say, uh, of course, free speech is important, but the idea that you would pursue this agenda in the courts rather than through the democratically elected representatives of the people is a huge strategic error and is a wrong turn. And I want to emphasize that that was a very common view among progressives who increasingly were calling themselves liberals during this period and would become uh, the core of New Deal liberalism in the 1930s. Progressives continued to hold this view during this period, that free speech was important, but that the courts were not the right place to look for it. And they're saying not just it's wrong because litigation wouldn't work and it's a, not a smart strategy. They're saying it's fundamentally not right to turn to the courts to adjudicate for us what is free speech, what isn't free speech, right? So what was their idea of how should these issues been resolved? Because we know we end up with the, the ACLU going this route and actually putting the court in this position. Okay, okay so, so this is where we come back to the labor cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have to understand why is it that these progressives were opposed to judicial enforcement of the First Amendment? Because we've lost sight of this, right? So most people are aware, especially today as we keep hearing the uh, term Lochnerization of the First Amendment over and over again, most people are aware that during the first two decades of the 20th century, the judiciary was associated with what was understood at the time to be a constitutional liberty of contract. This was a right that was written in to the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Uh, and the idea was that the Constitution shielded the right of individuals to freely contract with one another. And Can you tell me one thing about the Lochner case. So this is early 1900, 1904, 1905. So tell me what that case is, because the Lochnerization is what follows on this case then about this liberty of contract? Right. So it's a, there, and I should say there were a number of other cases, both at the state and federal level, but the one that has in historical memory gotten the most traction was Lochner itself, Lochner v. New York, which was a 1905 case in which the Supreme Court struck down a New York maximum hours law for bakers on the theory that it infringed liberty of contract. And the idea was that workers should have a right to negotiate for individual contracts for wages and hours that progressive reformers considered inadequate to their needs, essentially. So this was progressives criticized the courts for advancing a notion of liberty of contract that was based on atomistic individual rights that they said were not plausible, that individuals lacked the bargaining power to really right. undertake meaningful contracts of this kind. And there were a number of ways in which 
progressives and their allies during this period understood that you could respond to this. So there was disagreement over one theory of labor unions was that it essentially was a means of amassing the necessary countervailing power to engage in meaningful contracts of this kind. Uh, not everybody felt this way. A lot of progressives denounced class fracturing of this kind and thought that we should be committed to an overarching view of the public good. But in any case, all of these people agreed over one issue, which was that the courts were a stumbling block to the sort of legislation and ameliorating measures that were necessary to counteract rising wealth inequality in a period when it is not an exaggeration to say that there was class war in the United States. It was clear by this point that freedom of contract was not going to solve the problem. Laissez-faire constitutionalism was not going to solve the problem of an increasing wealth gap and crippling poverty in mm -hmm. the United States. And so progressives were most upset about these Lochner-style cases, right? So these are cases in which these prize progressive reform efforts like minimum wage or workers' compensation or maximum hours laws were struck down as unconstitutional. The labor movement was actually more concerned about another abuse of judicial power, which was the so-called labor injunction. This was the interference by courts in the ability of the labor unions to use what were then described as uh, and continue to be described as their economic weapons, weapons like boycotting, picketing, organizing, and the strike. These were the core tactics that labor unions were trying to use. And it's easy to understand in retrospect how many workers would have considered these to be expressive rights. And we can, we can sort of get to this later because they resemble the core civil rights picketing and boycott tactics of the mid 20th century. They tried to get them, some groups actually did try to get them constitutionally protected under the first amendment during the early 20th century. Those efforts failed miserably. Uh, but in any case, these were the issues that labor unions were most concerned about. And the exercise of judicial authority that they really resented was the intervention by courts invoking the antitrust laws or various common law right. rights to, to shut, shut down, down this sort of labor so, activity. And if I get your history right, so then you have the 1920s, you have this great moment when Holmes and Brandeis have a kind of change of heart, change of conscience. It's a very dramatic telling that over one summer, they reverse themselves. They say, well, we must sort of prohibit these kind of anti-war protests. And then suddenly they see the light. And then we quote these dissenting opinions today as the guide to everything. But you're saying in the 1920s, the ACLU turns toward the court. While it had been so skeptical after Lochner to say the court's not going to look out for the interests of workers, but saying we're going to start looking at the court to regulate or to intervene on the behalf of the rights that we want to obtain. So that's a gradual shift. So yeah, so just correct me if I'm not getting this history. This, I'm looking at the 1920s right now, right? Yeah. yeah, I've sort of taken us through the the teens. And in fact, there were a number of high profile cases during this period that made, even during the war, that made progressives and the labor movements even more deeply skeptical of the judiciary because they continued to issue these injunctions. They continued to shut down labor activity and lots of skepticism toward the judiciary. Now, meanwhile, there's this separate, it's sort of operating on related but parallel tracks. There's this new understanding that the judiciary might have a role to play in enforcing the First Amendment. So let me let me explain first why the progressives, some progressives, started to make an about face on this point. So I've said already that both progressives and the labor movement were extremely committed to free speech before the war. It's not that they weren't committed to free speech. The labor movement, I've already said, understood some of these tactics in free speech terms. They certainly understood advocacy as important. Meanwhile, progressives understood that progressive change had happened due to the open discussion of ideas, that ideas that had been considered taboo or illegal a couple decades ago had now been mainstreamed and that free speech was indispensable to that. 
What happens during the war, and this is the emergence of the modern conception of civil liberties, is this idea that it's possible to understand free speech not as another one of these individual rights that is a trump on state authority, but rather as a catalyst for the exercise of state authority. That if you're going to have a strong state, which all of these progressives thought you needed, that you also needed to shield the inputs into the democratic process that we're going to enact that legislation. And also you needed to make sure that the democratic process was open in order to buttress its legitimacy. And the idea that Chafee and others introduced was this notion, and it wasn't new entirely, but it gained new acceptance during this time, was that there was a public interest in ensuring open communication and that the court in enforcing free speech could actually effectuate the public interest rather than merely trumping the democratic exercise of, of power. So that, that view starts to emerge. What's important about the ACLU is that they were actually driven. So, so this, this view that I've just articulated, although it's beginning to emerge, as I said, did not become mainstream among progressives during this period. Yeah. And in fact, I really want to emphasize the point that the fact that Holmes and Brandeis were starting to articulate this in dissents is no indication that it had mainstream acceptance or that it was persuading anyone. And we know this, you know, we could give a really good historical analog to this, which is that Holmes had written a scathing dissent in Lochner v. New York. Oh. He and Brandeis had been uh, continuing to voice the same arguments articulated in that dissent in many subsequent Lochner-style cases and had gotten nowhere with it. They had not managed to persuade their fellow justices, right? Yep. And in fact, wouldn't until, uh, not, that wouldn't change until the mid 1930s. So I think we are reading too much into the power of a, a Holmes dissent, even though, of course, rhetorically it was quite persuasive. The ACLU had a very different understanding of why one would litigate cases. And this was the one, I think, that that managed to move people more on, on the ground eventually, although not at first. So we think of the ACLU as an organization that is maybe uniquely committed to principle, yes. right? Committed to free speech uh, as an ideal, uh, free speech for ideas we hate, etc. Do you mean... We do think of the ACLU, and I've had Nadine Strassen on the program. I'm going to have David Cole next week. I've had Emory Sykes, who's an attorney. Principle meaning the abstract or neutral principle. So free speech, and they don't take a position which way it falls. They don't take a position on what people say. They just say, you have the right to say whatever you want. That's what we're going to defend. So you mean principle as an abstract or an open category, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, and uh, and and certainly that was the view of the ACLU by 1940. That's how it framed its agenda, its mature position on free speech. And by that, I mean the view it's taken since it became the organization we recognize as the ACLU today has consistently espoused that reading of its commitment to civil liberties and to the First Amendment. The deep irony is that the ACLU first turned to the courts and to a judicially enforceable understanding of First Amendment because it was the it was the organization most willing to sacrifice principle. What I mean by that is that its progressive allies really criticized it for its willingness to use the courts in this way because they understood this tailoring to the counter-majoritarian exercise of constitutional rights as legitimating the Lochner-style cases, which all of them resented. And so the idea here was that this was a betrayal of principle, that, that good progressives were pushing to limit the authority of the courts. And here comes the ACLU, and it's trying to buttress the authority of the courts and of constitutional rights. I should really say that this is not a marginal view among progressives during this period. So as a presidential candidate in 1912, Theodore Roosevelt uh, advocated for uh, essentially 
uh, getting rid of judicial review. Uh, there were many prominent progressives who thought that judicial review was standing in the way of American democracy and needed to be scaled back. Uh, and here comes the ACLU all of a sudden trying to increase the authority of the courts. Now, to understand why that happened, we have to understand, actually, that in 1920, that wasn't the ACLU's intent at all. So in 1924, when the ACLU takes a position on judicial review, it still says we should get rid of judicial review. So the ACLU in 1924 says judicial review is a terrible idea. We should eliminate it. So what's it doing turning to the courts? Uh, it actually had quite a different theory of what litigation would accomplish. So borrowing here from the industrial workers of the world, the IWW and its famous free speech fights, the goal of the early ACLU cases was to do what it called show up the hypocrisy of the courts. What it wanted to do was illustrate that although conservatives and although the judiciary, which was regarded as conservative, paid lip service to constitutional rights, in fact, in practice, it only enforced what were then called property rights rather than personal rights. That when unpopular groups like labor radicals tried to articulate free speech claims, the court would not credit them. And of course, that's how it turned out. So you have uh, these ACLU lawyers explicitly saying that the cause of civil liberties in the courts was hopeless, but that there was still value in litigating cases because it would teach people that the courts were corrupt and hypocritical, and, and that that would, in fact, uh, help to drive the effort to scale back judicial review. They also saw this as it's, a it's, way- It's very dialectical and kind of complicated to say they're going to try to get to the court of the courts, put up cases to show that the courts are not deciding in a neutral or fair way. <laughs> so, That's absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. So a, lot of, uh, lot, a lot of hope placed in that people will get it and not just say, well, there's the decision of ruling. We'll go with it and they will see this is not even handed or fair. <laughs> Right. And we have to understand that that's why a huge part of the ACLU's strategy during this period was to publicize these decisions. Yeah. So it, this is what you know, Felix Frankfurter, who was very involved in the ACLU during this period by the late 1920s, really comes to dislike this strategy and says, we have to stop pursuing this strategy of propaganda through defeats in court. This is not helping anyone. But this was the strategy. It was propaganda through defeats in courts. And so the ACLU would organize uh, massive publicity efforts to disseminate these opinions. They would try to, they would appear at workers' meetings to show everybody that this is what the courts were doing. Uh, they also thought that this was a way of airing grievances from workers. So the, uh, the uh, 19 1918 IWW trial is a great example of this. Uh, the IWW was prosecuted for essentially interfering with the war effort, though everybody understood that this was a means, as, as prosecutors said, of prosecuting the IWW out of existence. What the ACLU did is it es essentially established a press service to get out bulletins uh, and launch letters to the editor and other ways of publicizing what was happening in these trials with the understanding that this was a way of bringing into the public sphere and into mainstream newspaper reporting all of the horrors that occurred in mines and with respect to labor abuses during this period. Eventually, the ACLU also came to believe that getting a dissent from a sympathetic judge was also a really important mobilizing tool, and that you could then take that dissent and go to a sympathetic governor or a sympathetic legislature and say, look, we need to fix this problem as a matter of politics. But, okay, so so that's the ACLU's early strategy. What, what happens is, over the course of the 1920s, as I said, there, there's increasing aversion to the strategy. Part of this is because 
the ACLU, which began as an organization with essentially no prominent lawyers, lawyering was a very marginal part of the ACLU, increasingly brings lawyers in to litigate these cases. And the lawyers quite naturally had a very different view of the courts. And it turned out so did their clients. So by the mid 1920s, the ACLU is saying, well, our clients actually don't want to go to jail. They don't want to just be publicity. Right. They want to win. And so the ACLU starts to pursue different sorts of legal arguments rather than the very high profile attacks on the legality or constitutionality of legislation like the Sedition Act. They start to make much more moderate claims about procedural irregularities or the insufficiency of the pleadings. And it turns out that they actually start to win this way. So they start to see some hope through incremental approaches for actually getting their clients off the hook. Mm -hmm. the, the bigger issue is that the prospect of change through agitation, which is what they had been fighting for in 1920, was considerably dimmed by the mid-1920s. So I haven't actually talked about the founding of the ACLU. The ACLU, when it was founded in 1920, declared itself, frankly, a partisan of labor. It said its place was in the fight. Uh, it understood uh, uh, the right, what, what it called the right of agitation, and that encompassed the right to organize, strike, and picket as the core rights that would advance workers' struggles. And, and I, should, I should say that the goal of this was peaceful, essentially, revolution. So the idea that was driving this was that to avoid what had happened in Russia, to avoid the horrors of a Bolshevik-style bloody revolution, you needed to protect peaceful means of achieving change. And the ACLU during this period was quite influenced by the IWW. Roger Baldwin, co-founder of the ACLU, had actually joined the IWW and disavowed the political state uh, in 1919, 1920, said he was never going to vote on... You actually talked... Jury again. I got to stop you for a moment. All of this is just amazing and fascinating. The ACLU is a decidedly partisan organization um, to defend labor rights, which are the kind of engine of America. You're saying the idea of a peaceful revolution, really a transformation of the conditions of life. And then the founder, as you said, and I've heard you say this elsewhere um, online, he said, I'm not going to vote anymore. I'm not going to serve on a jury anymore. So he's a kind of Henry David Thoreau, sort of civil disobedience in a radical way, that the state is not going to be in the interest of its citizens and I can't participate in that system. And he's one of the founders. <laughs> it's, it's more than that. It's that he believes that the state will inevitably serve the interests of capital. So let's stay he with this. That's really interesting to stay with that for a moment, just because I think that is your sort of history is saying there's a more complex history. It's not that simple that people turn to the courts for free speech rights and then they were granted these rights and we can celebrate this. The ACLU is saying the court will inevitably default on the side of power or on the side of the state as this having, of course, a huge monopoly on power. So it's really interesting that you're unearthing this history, which there's a kind of glorious history from 1919 and then through Holmes and Brandeis. Um, the courts look out for the little man, little woman, right? And you're saying, well, it's not that simple. There's a lot of distrust right there. That's right. So so uh, the early ACLU was deeply skeptical of state power. This was, as I said, influenced by this anarcho-syndicalist idea that the way to achieve peaceful revolution was for the workers in unison to lay down the tools of production, and that would leave capital with no choice except to turn them over to the workers, right? This is this is the vision that they have for peaceful uh, economic change. But it's important to say here that the ACLU was skeptical of both the state and the courts. They understood the courts as a state actor, right? This is sort of counterintuitive from perspective, today's perspective where we understand the courts as a check on the state. But for many people in this period, the courts were simply playing another role in deploying state power in the form of uh, labor injunctions, which were backed up by federal troops or police, et cetera. That was another form of deploying state power to quash worker uh, unrest. Um, and I think and this is important, just to stay with this for a moment, you're right what you just said, that today we assume the Supreme Court is 
one of the checks on the government, on the executive branch to say, we're going to, that's why we turn to the court all the time. And right now people turn to the court all the time and say, you have to correct if there's any overreach and these two other bodies and make sure that citizens' rights, civil liberties, et cetera, are protected. And you're saying at that moment, the ACLU says, oh, we're a bit skeptical. We think the court is maybe aligned with the state. That's, all, that's one continuous thing. And we have to take a position outside of that. Yeah. So, so, and this really distinguishes them from progressives, I have to say. So I already articulated the progressive, mm -hmm. I already told you that the progressives had a vision of free speech as buttressing state authority. The ACLU and its labor allies thought that the state was just as bad as the courts, in fact, maybe worse. And that's one of the reasons that eventually they're willing to strike out a uh, to to uh, stake out a, a uh, uh, alliance with conservatives who were also very skeptical of the state, and to use the courts increasingly as a tool for checking state power. This is the other half of the story of the emergence of the ACLU during this period, is this working together with conservatives who had always been quite enthusiastic about judicial review and about uh, judicial power. Uh, they were the they were the architects of uh, classical legal thought of this uh, of this understanding of constitutional rights that would impede state power and protect individual autonomy as they understood and property rights. Right. right. This is the core element of conservative constitutionalism during this period. Um, with respect to free speech, conservatives had. It historically voiced support for the concept of free speech. I should say everybody in American history has always said that they were for free speech. Nobody has come out against free speech, right? right. But as everyone understood, the question was, what is free speech? How free should free speech be? And what conservatives had historically done was they had distinguished between what they called liberty and license. And liberty was essentially the responsible exercise of free speech and everything on the license side, which included radical advocacy, advocacy of, of socialism or radical redistribution was not within the responsible exercise of free speech. What happens during the 1920s is that the, the ACLU tries to work together with conservatives on issues that conservatives were more open to, issues like academic freedom or sex education or private education. Uh, and these are cases that, again, are not considered First Amendment cases really today. So it's things like Pierce v. Society of Sisters and Meyer v. Nebraska, rights of private education or the right to teach foreign language instruction in the schools. Uh, these sorts of ideas motivated conservatives. And by doing this, the ACLU was eventually able to bring in allies on the right as well who were more sympathetic to this free speech friendly understanding. So I, so I, I want to ask you something about the, the title of your book, this kind of Shakespearean, the taming of free speech. Is the taming, are you referring to this alliance with conservatives who would uh, distinguish between liberty and license and regulate one type in our understanding today? Or is it that they are turning to the court as the court protecting free speech against the state, whereas you said the founders of the ACLU are skeptical of both the courts and the state. So where, what, gets, what part of speech gets tamed or how radical is it at the beginning? And then you're saying throughout this first decade of the ACLU, which becomes this incredibly important organization, something gets um, modified or tamed. Right. So the core... So there, that taming has a lot of aspects to it, but the central one is the idea that speech itself, which in the early 1920s meant these economic weapons. Justice Kagan talks about the weaponization of the First Amendment. I'm, I'm going to ask you, so that's <laughs> last summer, so going on strike or boycotting a store or telling your union members not to purchase something from that shop or something like that, to not buy those car, not those things. Those are economic weapons, and they could have been considered as speech, right? It's an expression. If I want to stand in front of some company and scream and yell and hold up placards, that's speech. Or if I don't want to go to work, that's my expression of what I believe in. Yes. Not only is that speech, I, I mean, I really can't emphasize enough, 
that was the particular mode of expression that the ACLU was most determined to protect throughout the 1920s and 30s when they talked about First Amendment protection for agitation, for the right of agitation, for the right for freedom of expression, what they wanted to protect was the right to organize, picket, boycott, and strike. And briefly, they achieved that in 1940, but the Supreme Court almost immediately pulled back from that. So if you open a, a labor law case book today, you will see that there's this sort of First Amendment exceptionalism in the labor law context. Worker speech of this type simply does not get First Amendment protection that is extended to almost every other kind of picketing and boycott. There are famous civil rights cases involving uh, the right to boycott, like NAACP v. Claiborne Hardware. Picketing and boycotts are core tactics, think of the abortion picketing cases, for many other kinds of speech. And yet in the labor context, they are routinely regulated. Okay, so this is this is really a major discovery in my view, because there is a history of this kind of inevitable, slow, bumpy progress that ultimately more and more rights are given. But you're saying the one thing where this court say, no, if you're working for a company, you can't pick it. You can't go and pick it. You can go Pick at a funeral, pick at an abortion clinic, pick at a school, all sorts of things, an embassy, but not, but in labor, so they carve out a space where they say this this doesn't fall under free speech. Yeah, so this is this is a great way to segue into the 1930s, and I'll, I, I can try to sort of speed up the the story <laughs> here. Essentially, what happens in the 1930s is that Roosevelt is elected, and the prospect of state interference on behalf of labor emerges for the first time in decades. And so the ACLU, for example, faces a crisis because the Roosevelt administration is seemingly protecting the Wagner Act in particular, the National Labor Relations Act, is presented as a statutory framework that will protect labor's economic weapons through law. And the ACLU doesn't know what to do about this. At first, it actually comes out against the Wagner Act on the theory that this sort of state intervention, as I've said, will inevitably eventually serve the interests of capital. And they're looking at fascism in Europe, and they think that there's a danger that we'll see fascism arise in the United States. And so they're really uh, ambivalent. And in fact, initially came out uh, against the, the Wagner Act for that reason. At the same time, they're able to get legislation through really important legislation under Hoover, which is the Norris LaGuardia Act, which curbs the power of the federal judiciary to interfere in labor disputes. It basically scales back the labor injunction by stripping the federal courts of jurisdiction to intervene and issue labor injunctions under most circumstances. So now the courts look a little less scary than they did because they're no longer playing this role in shutting down labor activity. And the state is looking a little more appealing than it did before. I should say by the mid 1930s, the ACLU came around because it turned out that the Wagner Act launched a period of massive labor organizing. The CIO emerges from this the Organization of Unskilled Workers, and eventually the ACLU comes around and sees this, in fact, as a civil liberties program. The Senate creates a civil liberties committee, the goal of which is to ensure that the, the Wagner Act is observed. Through all of this, the ACLU is reformulating its goals. But meanwhile, conservatives are also starting to rethink their historical commitments. What happens here is that conservatives historically had relied on other clauses of the Constitution to advance their rights. The, the Commerce Clause and liberty of contract and property rights, as I've already explained. What happens during the 1930s is there's a threat to that kind of constitutionalism. The New Deal administration looks like it has a mandate to pass laws to mitigate the effects of the Depression. And the Supreme Court repeatedly strikes these laws down. And by the middle of the 1930s, court curbing legislation looked quite possible. It actually looked 
plausible, and there will be resonance to today, uh, as, as I explain what happens in this period, looked plausible that Congress would enact court curbing legislation by uh, passing a constitutional amendment to limit substantive due process, to limit this idea of, of liberty of contract, or that they would authorize a legislative veto of Supreme Court decisions, or that they would require a Supreme Court supermajority to invalidate social and economic legislation. It seemed like something was going to happen to curb the power of the courts. Conservatives were terrified about this because the courts were the institution that they saw as the bulwark against redistribution. So what do they do? They, they take up all of these cases that the ACLU had litigated on behalf of radical defendants during the 20s and early 30s, and which they had uniformly opposed when they were litigated, uh, saying this isn't free speech. Uh, and they basically promote them. The ABA launches a public relations campaign to promote these as the best justification for maintaining judicial review. So you have these new dealers who are trying to get rid of judicial review, and you have these conservatives all of a sudden who are saying, this is why we need judicial review. It's to protect free speech and workers' rights. Um, now, of course, it doesn't work <laughs> because the Supreme Court ends up in 1937 with its famous switch in time, getting out of the business of review, reviewing social and economic legislation, and it actually upholds the Wagner Act, among other statutes. But by this time, conservatives actually had come to see other value in the First Amendment. So, so it, this is another sort of core part of the story, is that after the switch in time, it actually looked like the courts were simply going to get out of get out of the business of judicial review almost together. That they would just defer to legislatures in the manner of European style social democracy. Right? They would continue to police. Uh, they would continue to interpret statutes. They would continue to do the sort of common law interpretation they'd always done. But they were going to be really de deferential when it came to reviewing legislation. It's the ACLU that comes in together with conservatives and says, at this point, well, wait a second. We're going to create this exception, and this is the exception we today uh, associate with footnote four of Caroline Products. We're going to create this exception for the policing of inputs into the judicial process, uh, into the legislative process. We're going to keep judicial review with respect to free speech. Mm. It had a lot of resistance on that point. Its main ally at this point was the Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers, who understood almost immediately that the First Amendment could take the place of liberty of contract and property rights in invalidating legislation that, that they saw as trampling on their rights. Wow, so it's an amazing kind of history of where the First Amendment starts to play a role and it goes from one side to the other. It's really, it's really remarkable, actually, because this isn't a straight history at all. I, I want to get to... Elena Kagan, Justice Kagan, who yep. I think taught labor law at the University of Chicago before you, right? So, That's right. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're in big foot, following in big footsteps. So you've talked about this, how Justice Kagan has said in a dissenting opinion last year in the Janus case that the First Amendment has been weaponized. And the point I want to ask you about is to say, you, you've just explained that, of course, the First Amendment can be used for different ends and is it weaponized or is it instrumentalized? And Justice Kagan warned and said it can be used to advance the interest of those who are already in power, the powerful, and this should not happen because it is meant to be a defense of the powerless. And you said this is actually interesting compared to 100 years earlier, where the justices said exactly the opposite in a way. Or can you just say what this statement does? And you it know, may or may not be an important dissenting opinion. Maybe in 100 years, we'll look at Justice Kagan's dissenting opinion, <laughs> like we look at Holmes and Brandeis. Well, I think it captures something really important. So I, I do think there's this irony in the idea that the weaponization of the First Amendment by businesses as a deregulatory tool, which, as I said, emerged at the exact same moment that the modern First Amendment did in the late 1930s, is playing now the opposite role of... So these are labor economic weapons. And by 1940, when the Supreme Court issues its important decision in Thornhill v. Alabama, saying that peaceful picketing is within the First Amendment, you get this immediate spate of articles saying, what is the court doing here? 
This is essentially weaponizing the First Amendment. What they say is it's not that we think as an older generation of judges and academics did that labor activity is illegitimate. To the extent that the state legislatures want to authorize that activity, it's not the role of the courts to strike it down as unconstitutionally infringing liberty of contract. Okay, we're going to defer to legislatures. Right. But they say, but the courts are going one step further than that, and it's a big step. They are saying, uh, and it's unconstitutional for states to curtail that activity. And this is exactly the opposite way that it's being deployed today. Today, in the Janus case, you have a right-to-work movement saying that there's a free speech right in non-union workers to opt out of paying union dues. And the economic compulsion that they're worried about is the purported compulsion to fund this union activity. At this time, the critics of the First Amendment were saying you are essentially trumping the right of the legislature in this domain, and that's illegitimate. Right. Um, so, so the case is that people who are, don't want to pay their union fees and saying, I'm being co coerced to express a political opinion by this fee, and that's my form of speech, so I shouldn't be forced to do it. So the court says you cannot do that, so they strike down this law or rule or statute and say you cannot be forced to... Ex and these are public speech. sector statutes. Right. There's always concern that this could be carried over into the private sector through a complicated theory of state action in the NLRA context that I won't right. explain. But this is these are public sector statutes that are authorizing unions and the state to negotiate agreements that allow them to compel the payment of agency fees right, from right. anti-union workers, so that the, compel them to subsidize the cost of collective bargaining and other core economic activities. And these workers are saying that infringes my, my rights. So the way the court looks at it differently over the span of 100 years, one saying we're going to look at it in sort of protecting labor rights. And Lena Kagan saying it does now use the First Amendment to actually rule in favor of what is her concern? What's her worry that the First Amendment is so flexible? Because isn't your history about that the First Amendment has been used in different ways? So the question really is whether the ACLU, I mean, if you're going to, if you want to, evaluate this history from, from a normative perspective today, looking forward. The question is whether the ACLU took a wrong term by making this bargain. So the ACLU understood in the late 1930s that investing the judiciary with the power to invalidate legislation on the theory that it infringed the right of free speech, that that would also protect the right of employers to disseminate anti-union propaganda, right. that it would also protect commercial advertising, that it would serve as a hook for conservatives to unsettle regulatory efforts to help working people, essentially. But they also thought that their view of the First Amendment was extremely powerful. They thought that in a a uh, free market of ideas, they could win. And the reason was because they thought that the First Amendment, as it did in Thornhill, was going to come to protect concerted activity of this type, the collective power of workers, which was extraordinarily powerful. I, I know we don't have time, so I can't go into sort of the power of the secondary boycott and the secondary strike, which had always been deemed coercive and economic rather than e expressive, coercive rather than persuasive. It hadn't been protected under the First Amendment for that period, for that reason. But they thought that the First Amendment could, in fact, protect this activity because it happened through speech. Right. And had they been right, the calculus might have come out quite differently, right? We know from the 1940s how powerful that kind of union organizing was. But almost immediately, the Supreme Court said, oh, no, we've made a mistake. That can't be protected, First Amendment activity. Mm -hmm. uh, legislatures can regulate that activity. And of course, with the Taft-Hartley amendments to the NLRA in 1947, those tactics were basically shut down. And it continues to be the case today that secondary activity is regulated by Congress, it's prohibited, and that if somebody tries to engage in it, 
the damages that are levied against them are just as bad as they were during the Lochner era. Amazing. So the ACLU failed on its own terms to get those things Amazing. protected. But we don't think of them today as part of free speech. When we talk about this robust right of free speech, we're talking about the right of soapbox speakers to disseminate socialist propaganda. We're talking about the right of flag burners. The ACLU never really thought that that kind of speech would be transformative. They wanted to protect it. Yes. But it wasn't what they were really concerned about. What they really wanted to protect was the right to picket and boycott. And that today has no First Amendment protection. You know, we have to recognize that when we think about whether this bargain paid off. There's a tendency to say, well, uh, I, I think in hearing the history that I've just uh, given to you that, oh, well, the ACLU got it right by 1940 when it said you have to protect the rights both of workers and of, uh, and of uh, uh, employers. But, but the question really is, did they get it right insofar as the courts didn't protect right, right, the right, rights right, that right. they've been advancing? Yeah. I want to ask you one other question about this term, the weaponization of free speech, which comes up so much. And as a legal scholar, whether you think that's actually, um, we know what that means. It's supposed to mean it's used for the wrong ends. But you've discovered a history or written a history and saying, well, it's not totally clear what the ends, it's a tool, people bet on it, think it's going to work. Of course, it can be used against its own intentions. But do you think weaponization is actually a particular danger for free speech? Or can't this happen to any statute, law, rule, norm, that it can be used against whatever intentions were there originally? I suspect, you know, all weapons can be turned against their wielders, right? Uh, I think the key is to understand that free speech is a powerful weapon or could be a powerful weapon and that it was meant as such, that that was the whole point of this. And, and that's what we have to understand in evaluating the path forward today. So, I mean, I, I've told you what the end point of this was, which is the stripping away of constitutional protection for the right to strike. I think there's a few conclusions we can draw from that. So we could say that this was just about the court getting it wrong, that the ACLU had it right as a matter of principle, that free speech should protect all of this, but that the, that the court committed an error by not protecting this speech. And then you would point to a series of 5-4 decisions during the middle of the 20th century and say it could have gone differently in those picketing cases, it could have gone differently in Buckley v. Valio, it could have gone differently in the commercial speech cases. And then the problem is essentially just one of judicial appointments, that we need to, to come back to this capacious understanding of free speech that the ACLU had, but we just need to change, we need to, to, to show the courts that they got this wrong. Um, there's another possibility, which is that the ACLU's critics during the 1930s had it right when they said that, yes, free speech is important, but the judiciary as an institution inevitably will serve as a check on the kind of radical redistribution that you're talking about. That the judiciary, for reasons of judicial temper or for reasons of judicial training or just because of the nature of legal argument and thought, is always going to temper truly radical forms of expression. And if that's your view, then the problem is really essentially the judiciary as an institution. Now, I'll say there's a third possibility, too, which is that the ACLU was wrong to essentially fetishize free speech in the first place, that they were wrong. There were other critics in this period who said the same, that, of course, free speech is vitally important, but so is equality, so is human dignity, and that those that rights will always inevitably come into conflict, and that what the ACLU got wrong was you know, by promoting the idea that free speech should always trump national security, it made it unpalatable to say that other values like uh, equality were also important ones that would occasionally need to be balanced against free speech. I don't think history can tell us which of those views is right. This is, this is great. Those three views that actually either we can find the correct way of looking at free speech or we're giving too much power to the judiciary or actually the way that put too much emphasis on free speech over other constitutional rights is maybe the wrong path. This is 
so tremendously helpful because I'll ask David Cole those three questions. <laughs> and then, since he's now at the helm of the ACLU, he's going to say, well, what, what is, did you do the right thing? Did you place too much power to the courts? Or can you, is it maybe actually you went the wrong, you took a wrong turn here. <laughs> so. Well, I very much look forward to, to listening to his yes. response. <laughs> so Laura, thank you so much. This has been tremendously, uh, really such a fascinating history. And I love this kind of deep, uh, analysis and research to have a corrective history of maybe it's not that simple, a straight line from 1919 till today that has made everybody's lives better. It's been a pleasure. Thanks yeah. so much. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay. Thank you.